Hey guys, welcome back to the Maranatha Global Bible Study. In this session, we're going to be looking at what I'm titling this session to be the New World Order and the Coming World War. It's a very heavy session. The next few sessions are going to be incredibly heavy, actually, as we dive into a word-by-word -word exposition of the judgment events described in Revelation chapter 6. It's probably going to take us about a month to work through this. Um, I don't know how long we'll be in this, but it's going to be a little while because these events are very consequential. They're very weighty uh, and it deserves um, patient attention. So thank you guys for tuning in and joining with us as we continue on. A quick word for those of you who are new to the FAI app or to the FAI YouTube channel. You may be trying to wrap your head around who is FAI, what do these guys do? There's film, there's teaching, there's this, there's that. Our primary core mandate as a spiritual family and as an organization is on the ground local ministry, exalting the worth of Jesus among the unenreached and unengaged at the end of the age. Our primary obsession as a spiritual family is laying foundations where there are none in the Middle East predominantly and predominantly in conflict zones. So one of the ways that you can get involved in that is by prayer and a massive way that you can get involved in it is by giving $5 a month. You say, oh, how does that, how does $5 a month affect anything? A couple months ago, we started thinking about it. We said, man, if, if let's just say 25% of all of people who enjoy the FAI app and the free content that we give away every day on the app gave $5 a month, that would cover our whole budget in the Middle East and conflict zones. It's, it's pretty remarkable and it's very easy to do. It's very, any of us, almost any of us, can afford $5 a month and not really feel the pain of it and yet have a massive impact in the Middle East if we do it collectively. So I wanna invite you to do that. If you say, well, I don't know where the money goes to. Here's where the money goes to. The church in Iran. You can watch our film, Sheep Among Wolves, and see the details of this. It goes to on the ground ministry to the Kurds in Iraq, Syria, Turkey, and in Iran. You can see that in our film, Better Friends, than mountains one and two. It also goes towards general conflict zone ministry and a, a whole bunch of different ministry initiatives all over the Middle East, North Africa, Mediterranean Basin, Asia, into the Himalayas. You can see all this in very vivid up close detail in our film, The Frontier, and all things Israel related you can see in our films, Covenant and Controversy. Now all these films are free on the app and on the website. This is where our budget goes. All the budget for media and film is raised separately. It doesn't come out of this bucket. I don't take a salary. Uh, all the funds that come in through the $5 campaign go to, which is not a campaign, it's really just the baseline. If you wanna support ministry in the Middle East and you love the Maranatha message running like wildfire, consider giving $5 a month and subscribing. It's very easy, uh, it's secure on our app and on our website. With that out of the way, Let's jump into Revelation chapter six. The last two sessions, Joel Richardson has done a beautiful job laying the groundwork for understanding the, the nature of the structure of the book of Revelation, the Jewish background, the biblical context of the judgment events. Today, I'm gonna to begin to jump into a word-by-word -word exposition of it, which is gonna take a considerable amount of time over the next few weeks and potentially months to go through these events because they're massive, massive consequential events. But I wanna lay some groundwork as we do that. And I wanna echo what Joel said as well and concerning being dogmatic about things that the, uh, scripture is not quite clear on. Here's our goal as we move into these notoriously difficult and controversial passages. Our goal is to shout what the Bible shouts, whisper what it whispers, and be silent about what the Bible is silent about. Now there's a lot of things in the judgment events, namely the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls in Revelation. There's a lot of things in there that the Bible, throughout the Bible, sh shouts at us that are tied to these events. And there's some things in these texts that the Bible whispers about that we have to ponder and consider and we, we weigh up. And there's some things that the Bible is silent about concerning these events. There's just not information about it. That our approach is we want to, typically what happens with a lot of end time stuff is that people end up shouting what the Bible is silent about. 
and they end up being silent about what the Bible shouts about. We want to stay faithful to the scripture and we want to be transformed by the testimony of the scripture and to love Jesus more, to become more obedient disciples of him, to become faithful witnesses as we approach the days when these things will unfold. We take the Bible very seriously. We want to honor the authority of the scripture because we believe that the authority of the scripture is what it gives the power for the transformation of the human heart under the authority of the Holy Spirit. So with that said, let's jump into it. We're gonna talk about the nature of the seals. So as we go through Revelation, the book of Revelation, starting in chapter six to the end of the book, we see really a long story arc of the transition from the present evil age to the age to come. That's the simplest way to, to, to give an overview or to summarize Revelation 6 through 22, which is the, the bulk of the book of Revelation. It's describing the story arc of the transition from this present evil age to the coming age and the restoration of all things. And the details in that, you could say, ah, well, you know, it's, it's gonna happen no matter what, so, you know, why bother learning the details? Well, if he gave us the details, we should bother to learn the details because it's kind of like with my kids. I say something to my kids and oftentimes, you know, when they don't listen or they, you know, they go do something else, I say, kids, why do you think I said that? I wouldn't have said it if I didn't want you to hear it and obey it. I don't just put information out there for you as your father, just randomly to be like, oh, actually that's irrelevant information, don't worry about it. I tell my kids things because I love them and I believe that the information is important and that their obedience to what I'm telling them is necessary. And I believe that there's a lot of obedience passages in the book of Revelation that we need to take seriously. But, but the thing is, this is why I care about the judgment events, our ability to obey the commands of the book of Revelation is increased or diminished to the degree that we understand or don't understand the context and the events in which that obedience is required. And that's why we need to look at these events in a very serious way, in a very patient way, and with humility and with a dependence upon the Lord to teach us. So, as Joel said in his session, uh, you know, when you get two guys teaching the book of Revelation together, you're probably going to have differences of opinion here and there. I would say I'm 99% in agreement with everything that Joel taught in the last sessions. There's be some differences of verbiage, vocabulary. I would see it this way, a little bit this way. I'm probably more post-trib than I am pre-wrath, but never mind. We'll get into the details of that as we go. And as Joel said, it's not really that important if we understand that we are all going to face the Antichrist in the generation of the Lord's return, and that we need to obey all the commands that the Lord gave the church in the generation of the Lord's return. The great divide is over the issue of being on the earth when these things unfold. We've, we've done a lot of sessions on this. You can go do that later if you want to. I'm not gonna get into that now. But the point is this, I'm not gonna be dogmatic about some things and I'll tell you where I don't know things. And I'll tell you what I do know. But my goal and my role in teaching really is to say the things that the Bible says, to shout what the Bible shouts. So I'm not gonna do a whole session of things that I don't know, but when I get to a point that I don't know, I'll, I'll be honest with you. And there are some things in here I just don't know. And we'll actually begin with some of that. The nature of the relationship, Joel touched on this, the nature of the relationship between the seals, the trumpets, and the bulls has been fodder for discussion and dialogue and debate since these things were penned. Is it, does the order of these things go seals, trumpets, bulls? Or do, does it go seals, trumpets, bulls? Does it, how, how do these things, how do the seals relate to the trumpets? How do the trumpets relate to the bulls? What do we know, what do we don't know? So I wanna talk about the seals in particular and break down what the Bible does say and what we can take away from the seals before we begin to exposit them and burrow down deep into them. Because the first seven seals are very significant, and specifically the first four. We're gonna spend the next four weeks or so looking at the first four seals, which describe a new world order that emerges and the final or the coming, the future world war. That's what we're gonna be looking at today in an introductory way and then in more detail in the future uh, sessions. The, the, the concept of a new world order has been used in the secular world, in the church world, conspiracy world, 
political world, government world, there's lots of context that that term is used. I'm using it here, and you may say, Do you, are you using it in this way or in that way? What I mean is that there is an order, a structure, a, a, a authority structure that's coming, that's going to be a new global order that's going to change the one that you currently know now. Completely reconfigure the face of the earth, especially the Middle East, but the whole face of the earth is going to be reconfigured leading up to the coming, the future, the final world war, which is described in vivid detail in the book of Revelation and described in, in, in incredible detail, in brevity, but in detail in Revelation chapter 6. Before we get into that, let's talk about the nature of the seals. I have just seven things here that I'm going to run through very quickly that are important. Number one, the seals are released by Jesus. This is not Satan releasing suffering on the earth. This is not, uh, you know, accidents happening. This is not men just sinning and deciding to do things. This is Jesus in his sovereignty tearing the seals in response to the body of Jesus on the earth, the body of Christ, the church, the family, the covenant family of God, crying out with a Maranatha cry, come Lord Jesus. They are saying, you, O Lord Jesus, are worthy to take the scroll. Loose the seals that are on the scroll. So if you have a scroll, okay, imagine a scroll. There's seven wax seals that keep the scroll rolled up. And when that scroll is unrolled, the end of all things is fully at hand and will be fully realized. There's seals, and that what the, the saints in heaven and on earth will be saying leading up to this moment is, Jesus, take the scroll from the hand of the Father, tear the seals from the scroll. You're worthy to do it. Lord, do it. And when he tears, each one that he tears, there's a judgment event released upon the earth. But the point is this, the saints are the catalysts for the event of Jesus himself, who's described in Revelation 6 repeatedly as the lamb, not the lion, not the judge, not Messiah, not any of these other terms. He's described as the lamb. The lamb of God is tearing the seals from the scroll. That's number one. Number two, the dynamic that we know for sure about the seals is that they're eschatological, meaning they're end time events. Why do I make a point of this? Because there's a lot of commentaries and there's a lot of teaching and there's a lot of stuff out there from history and at present that would take events from the Revelation chapter six and they would put it in history past. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but I will just say this, that it is foolish and dangerous to take the events of the book of Revelation and put it into the past and then wash your hands of it. And that's really why I, I say it's dangerous, is because if you take information that is, it was given for a specific time frame, take it out of its time frame, put it in one that's past, which means you are absolved of any responsibility to that information, you can wash your hands of it, move on, and live your life totally disconnected from the reality. The, the technical term for this is called preterism or amillennialism or postmillennialism. These different systems of theology take the events of the book of Revelation and they put them either in the first century or they scatter them throughout different time frames in human history. I remember talking with a very high level theologian at one point. He was a, an amillennial leaning uh, a theologian and one of his interpretations of one of the events was that it was the yellow fever in the 1600s after something and I was going man there's zero biblical context for that there's there's just where it's so kooky it doesn't make any sense how do we know it's eschatological two reasons we know that number one because the saints the bowls of incense fill in Revelation 5 and then Jesus takes the, takes the scroll from the hand of the Father, and it culminates with the wrath of the Lamb covering the whole earth, and Jesus ruling and reigning in Jerusalem and restoring all things. This is not a historical thing. It's not a continual cycle. That's another view, that this, these things happen in cycles. It, the first, second, third, fourth seal, these are not cycles, guys. These are eschatological, apocalyptic events that take place in 
the final seven years of this present age. Now, whether it's in the final seven or the final three and a half, we'll talk about that here in a moment. The third dynamic is that these are all, because they're eschatological, they're all future. They're all future. Number four, this is an important one, they are all sequential. How do you know that they're sequential, Dalton? Well, because you know to know the Greek word for the first seal? You know what the Greek word is? What it means? I'm being cheeky here, but it means the first. Do you know what the Greek word for second means? You can see where I'm going with this. Second. The Lord doesn't number things that aren't to be numbered. He doesn't put things in sequential order if they're not supposed to be in sequential order. Case in point, the book of Exodus. When the plagues are released, it was called the first plague, the second plague, the third plague. When the Lord gives numbers to judgment events, they're always sequential and numerical and happen in order. Which means this, you can know with absolute certainty after the second seal comes the third, after the third comes the fourth, after the fifth comes the sixth, and so on and so forth. Which raises the question then, how did the trumpets and the bulls relate to the seals? We'll talk about that more later. Number five, the next dynamic of the judgment events is that they are intensifying. Meaning this, the first one is a rider on a white horse. That's a dynamic. The second one, peace is taken from the earth. The third one, there's economic collapse takes place. The fourth one, death and pestilence breaks out across the other a quarter of the earth's population dies. It continues to escalate until the wrath of God is poured out upon the earth in full and it's finished. Now, regardless of whether it's the, the order of the, the 21 events, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bulls, whether it's like this in order, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, or whether it's like this, or whether they overlap and dovetail a little bit, either way, it goes to an appointed end and all of them as three separate family events of judgment, seals, trumpets, bulls, they all increase in intensity that culminate and crescendo in, a fi in finality, which is a very important point about all the, the seventh of each set of judgments. The seventh seal ends with incredible, the sixth and the seventh, I should say, end with incredible finality. The seventh trumpet ends with incredible finality. We read this in Revelation chapter 11. When the sounding of the seventh trumpet happens, the mystery of God is complete, it says in chapter 10, and it says in chapter 11 that the kingdoms of this world become the, kingdoms, the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. At the seventh trumpet, Jesus inherits everything. At the set, pouring out of the seventh bowl, it says it is done, it is complete. So the point is this, there is a profound, profound finality and ultimacy to the sixth and the seventh events that eclipse the intensity of the first and the second events in the judgment series. We'll talk about that more in detail later as well. Number six, the, the judgment events in Revelation chapter six are intentional. They are intentional. Because Jesus is the one doing them, and because the Father is the one with, who's holding the scroll that Jesus takes, they are, you can guarantee, be guaranteed that they are thoughtful, they're intentional, they're deliberate, they're not accidental. Now here's why I say this. Right now we're living in a moment of history because of this COVID-19 pandemic debacle balagon that's taking place on the earth right now. There is a, a temptation, I've heard a lot of believers talk about this, like, do you think God is involved in this? And if he is, what is he doing? Is he sovereign? Did he allow it? Did he orchestrate it? Did he initiate it? Like, what, what's going, how do you, theologically, how do you understand these things? Those questions are gonna get even more dramatic and more pressing as these judgment events break out on the earth. It's very important because when they break out on the earth, there is gonna be a temptation to feel like, Oh, wow, God's not on the throne. The Father is not in control. Jesus cannot be trusted. Who knows where this thing is going? And that's why we need to go deep in these events to understand the intentionality on the part of Jesus. There is a logic to these events. Now, as Joel mentioned in the last sessions, the first seal that is released is the rise of the final Antichrist which we're gonna look at here in a moment in detail. It's the rise of the final Antichrist. 
Now, as the Antichrist rises, the next event that takes place is peace is taken from the earth. Jesus takes peace from the earth. After peace is taken from the earth, there is famine and economic collapse. There's war that breaks out because of this thing. And then when the war, and then because of the war, because of the economic impact of this thing, there's now a health impact. There's pandemics, there's pestilence, there's plague breaking out. The sword is flying, blood is spilling, but it's intentional. It's crowding the nations into a specific corner for the final confrontation with what is true, what is not. And the Lord is going to push the nations of the earth. It says this in, in Isaiah 26, that when the judgments of God are on the earth, the inhabitants learn righteousness. The Lord is going to instruct and the nations of the earth are going to learn righteousness as the judgment events are intentionally released upon the earth. Now, what's very important about this is as the judgment events are being poured out on the earth, the knowledge of God becomes the most important thing. The knowledge of God becomes the most important thing because who knows what he's doing? Why is he doing it? Where is it going? What does he want? Is he a tyrant? Is he a cruel, merciless? What is he doing? Why is he causing this? Why is he doing this? Because the message in that day is not going to be, you know, this is human sin, and we're going to be like politically condemning world leaders for their decisions. The message is Jesus is doing this. Yes, the leaders of the nations are going to bear responsibility. Yes, every man, woman, and child is going to bear responsibility for what they do in these days. But there is an intentionality on the part of the Lamb of God who is executing the judgments of God on the earth when these events are breaking out. Which leads us to the seventh and final point about the nature of the sealed judgments. They're multi-purpose. They're multi-purpose. What do I mean by that? They are affecting it's like one stone, each judgment event is like one stone that kills 500 birds, to use the analogy. Meaning, it's, it's not as though the, the, in releasing these judgment events, the Lord is just doing one thing. He's doing a thousand things with that one thing. By raising up the Antichrist and giving him authority, which is a very controversial but very important point, both the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 11, Daniel chapter 7, and the, the book of Revelation chapter 12 and 13, describe the rise of the Antichrist as a sovereignly ordained event, not a demonic event that happens against the will of God. It happens because of the will of the sovereignty of God, which is a very critical point. The Antichrist will be raised up sovereignly by God. Now, the purpose of this is manifold. There's a purpose for this in the church, because the church will face the Antichrist. The apostles are very clear about this in Thessalonians and in 1 John and in the book of Revelation, that the church will be on the earth and she will face the Antichrist. Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 11 is very clear about this. The saints will face his fury. And he will, the Lord will produce things in the body of Christ globally through the rise of the Antichrist. He's also going to produce things in Israel through these events. He's also going to produce things in the Gentile nations. He's also going to produce things in the Antichrist and his coalition by these events unfolding. All of these things are manifold and multi-purpose. Multi it's also going to affect the evil one, Satan, and it's going to affect the powers and principalities and rulers of the air. It's going to affect the spiritual unseen realm. It's going to affect the seen realm, the political realm, the military realm, the financial realm. It's going to affect every single realm. Every single dynamic of the created order is going to be affected by these judgment events. These are not events to be trifled with. They are not events to be marginalized or rendered irrelevant. They are very significant. You need to understand them because if you or your children lives through them, it is going to shake everything that can be shaken, Hebrews 11 says. Sorry, Hebrews 12. He is going to shake everything. that can, If it can shake, it's going to shake. Which means this, the wheat and the chaff is going to fall and separate. And the chaff in your life and in my life is going to be blown away in this time. And we're going to find out how much of us is wheat and how much of us in us is chaff. 
You need to understand these events and we need to go deep in understanding them. So let's look at this. Let's jump into verse one of chapter six. Now I watched the lamb. I watched when the lamb opened one of the seven seals and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a loud voice like thunder, come, which is interesting. The beginning of all of the first four seal judgments, a loud voice thunders to John. John, come. There's an invitation here. Come. Come here. Draw near. Open your eyes. Open your ears. Open your heart. Open your mind. Humble yourself. Listen. Pay attention. Watch what the Lamb is about to do. And that's what I would say to us right now. Come. Behold. Listen. Pay attention. Watch this. Turn your ear. Incline your ear. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. And its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him. And he came out conquering and to conquer. Very interesting grammar. He came out conquering and to conquer, which means there is a, an initial preliminary conquest, and there is a secondary conquest. There's gonna be the initial one that people see, but there's gonna be another conquest, to conquer. He comes out conquering now, but he's coming to conquer. There's a specific conquest that he's on that you're not gonna see at first, but you will see second. I wanna come back to this word come for a minute. The, this is a prophetic call to the global body of Christ right now that I believe that the Holy Spirit is thundering. Come consider the judgment events in the book of Revelation. Come consider what's about to take place. Come consider this new world order that's about to rise, the implications for you. I think the COVID situation has been a profound gift to shake us up to be able to consider the reality that in a moment, one little thing can change that can set off a chain reaction and shut the earth down. Now, we have all different kinds of opinions about the COVID thing. You know, who's responsible for it? Is it blown out of proportion? Is it a serious thing? How should we deal it? Masks, no masks, vaccines, no vaccines. Everyone has an opinion. Everyone's arguing about it. But I want to make this point regarding the COVID thing. Regardless of what you think about what it is and what the world should do about it, you can't argue with the fact that it brought the world to a screeching halt. And I want to say this emphatically and clearly with gentleness, but I wanna say this with clarity. The COVID thing is not even a speed bump compared to where we're going in terms of the, glo the, the, the catastrophic nature of the storm that is ahead of us. I mean, this is like, we're, we're gonna look back and we're gonna be like, do you remember when we thought that was bad? It's nothing, it's nothing compared to what's coming the impact of this thing. I was talking about it with my wife the other night. Isn't it crazy that children have not been affected in a wide scale way with this? That's not gonna be the case in the future pandemics. That's not gonna be the case in the future calamities. Children will be affected in a very heavy way. The impact of this thing is going to, it's a mercy that the COVID thing did not, you know, we didn't see images around the world of mass graves with children being buried in them. That it, it's, my point is this is it's, tiny compared to the monstrosity of the judgment events described in the book of Revelation. Let me, you say, well, that might be overblowing it, Dalton. I'm going to just do a quick spoiler alert for you. The fourth seal, 25% of the earth's population is killed in one judgment event. Let's just hypothesize here for a moment. Let's just say you know, world population right now, eight, nine, 10 billion, we don't know. Let's just say 10 billion by the time this stuff happens. 25% or a quarter of the Earth's population dying in one judgment event. 2.5 billion people dying in one judgment event in one concentrated time frame. That is absolutely staggering, guys. That's why I say that the COVID thing is, is nothing. It's like a rock in our shoe compared to the absolute avalanche 
of human suffering that is gonna break out on the earth because of these events. That the Messiah, the Savior that you and I love and worship is responsible for executing on the earth. Let's look at verse two. I looked and behold. I looked and behold. There's a I and there's a you in there. I looked now, audience, behold. You behold. Think, consider this. This is what I saw and you need to see it. I saw a white horse. Now there's some commentaries that will say the white horse. Ooh, white horse, I've heard of a white horse before. Who has, oh yeah, Jesus has a white horse. This must be Jesus. Think about the, the how goofy this is. Jesus tearing a seal and Jesus riding a horse on the seal judgment event. John would have been like, I saw Jesus tear a seal and Jesus ride a horse. He doesn't say that. He saw, I, I saw a rider bent on conquest. Now, why is, why is this event so significant and where does it fit in the chronology and timeline of end time events? Because there's a lot of different ways that we could look at this, this event. Um, all the commentaries are divided on this. Where in the chronology to put this? Is this Jesus or is this the Antichrist? I am, I am beyond confident and I would say even dogmatic about this point that this is not Jesus. This is the Antichrist. This is the final beast who comes out conquering and to conquer. This is one of the most consistent themes and threads throughout apocalyptic literature in the Old Testament and in the New Testament is that the final time of tribulation breaks out because of the rise of a little horn, a little tyrant, an antichrist, a beast. That's the consistent narrative. It doesn't, because some of the, the commentaries will say, oh, he's a white horse. It must mean that Jesus is going forth. You say, okay, if Jesus is going forth before World War, how's he going forth and what's he going forth to do? And they'll say, well, he's going forth to conquer the souls of men. That's right, to conquer. You say, who's, who's he going to go conquer? He's going to conquer the hearts of men and men are going to worship Jesus and they're going to, they're going to go to church. You go, hold on, that kind of doesn't fit at all with the, the rest of the chapter. The other horses bring incredible suffering to the earth. And, and I, think about this, you, you see the four horses, because the first four judgment events are four horses with four different colors. Now imagine looking at their riders, because this is the horses and their riders. Now imagine the horse and its rider, and then you, you look at, you know, like, ooh, man, there's the black one. His rider looks pretty scary. Ooh, there's the, the red one. Ooh, the pale one. Ooh, look at him. Ooh, look at the white one. Oh, it's Jesus. Hey, Jesus. It, it, can you, I mean, just the, this, the foolishness of imagining Jesus sitting on a horse next to four other horses that are, that are intentionally set before John to convey fear and trembling concerning what's coming. Not tormenting fear, but fear of the Lord fear. Like, we're going to have to face these things. I... There is, you should tremble. There should be a degree of fear. And you say, well, I don't agree in fear mongering. Beloved, if there's a Bible verse that says 25% of the earth's population is gonna be killed in one judgment event, and you don't feel any trembling over that, that's, that's not wisdom. That's foolishness and folly. And it's not fear mongering to say we should take it seriously. It's actually just humility. Because what it requires is our submission to the authority of scripture. I looked and behold a white horse, and its rider had a bow. A bow. It doesn't describe arrows or anything else. It describes just a bow, which means he's not in military, he's, he's in military procession mode, but he's not in combat. He's carrying a bow, but it's not, there's no weapons in it. Meaning at this point it's bloodless, so to speak. And a crown was given to him. Crown speaks of authority. This is the language of Daniel in the book of Revelation and 1 John and 2 Thessalonians. Authority is given to the final Antichrist. He does not take it. It is given to him. And he receives authority, it says. Antichrist receives it. As a very key interpretive passage that I would have you cross-reference in your own time, that's Deuteronomy 13. Deuteronomy 13, the, the Lord says through Moses to the people, it says this, if, if a false prophet rises up among you, an, an antichrist, so to speak, someone who oppose, and they teach you to walk away from the Lord and his teachings, his commandments, 
and draws you away to the worship of a false image, a false God, Moses says this, know this, the Lord raised him up. Why? To test you. To test your hearts. To see if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, your strength. The Antichrist is raised up by God sovereignly to test the hearts of all mankind. This, this passage is in full of consequence. A crown was given to him. A crown was given to him. He does not assume control. It was given to him. And he came out conquering and to conquer. He came out conquering, present tense, and to conquer with a vision for conquest. We know that final conquest is, it's Jerusalem. And he will be met, this rider on the white horse will, be, will meet another rider on another white horse at the end of the story in Revelation 19, where he will meet his end, which is described in vivid detail in Daniel chapter 11 and Daniel 12. Let's talk for a moment about when this first seal is torn. Joel touched on it. I want to touch on it as well. There are lots of options, lots of commentaries, lots of teachings on it. In my opinion and estimation, based on all of the information out there, there are only two viable options that make sense when you square it with everything. That the, the rider on the right white horse, that the first seal is torn either at the beginning of Daniel's 70th week, which begins the final seven years, or in the middle of Daniel's 70th week, with the abomination of desolation. Now, I, I'll tell you where I lean towards, and this is where I told you I'd tell you what I know and I don't know. I know that the rider on the white horse is the Antichrist. I know that. And I know that he sets in motion the events that culminate and escalate into the heavy birth pangs of the Great Tribulation that culminate in the return of Jesus, the resurrection of the dead, the deliverance of Israel, and the judgment of the wicked and the destruction of the Antichrist. All these events go together. I don't know if the first seal is describing his initial rise or his revealing when he establishes the abomination of desolation and attacks Israel. I don't know. And there's, there are good arguments for both cases. And in some sense, it doesn't necessarily change things because when the events begin to unfold, you're going to know very, very quickly what's happening. And a lot of this, if you're saying, I don't understand what you mean, Dalton, this will become clear as we get to the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth seals in the subsequent sessions. But here's why I believe these are our only two options. Because there are good verses that talk about the rise of the Antichrist before he invades Jerusalem and establishes the abomination of desolation. Now, Matthew 24, Jeremiah chapter 30, Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 11, Daniel 12, Revelation 12, Revelation 13, 2 Thessalonians 2, the list goes on of passages that describe the abomination of desolation or the desolation of Jerusalem as the consequential event that sets in motion the final 42 months, the final 1260 days, the final three and a half years. I mean, Revelation 10 communicates that, Revelation 11 communicates that, Revelation 12 and 13 all communicate that number, 42 months, three and a half years, time, times, and half a time, 1260 days. That, half, that, that final three and a half years is the hard labor pains of the Great Tribulation. And Joel touched on the birth pains in the, future, in the previous sessions. The question is, does the rise of the Antichrist set in motion the first half of the week which he does according to Daniel chapter 11, verse 21. Now, I would encourage you, if you haven't, to go watch the session from the Maranatha Global Bible Study that we did on the book of Daniel and look at the session of Daniel chapter 11, 21 through the end of the book of Daniel. This describes in incredible detail the rise of the Antichrist at the beginning of the seven year, final seven years that leads to, in verse 21, he rises. But then we see in verse 31, he invades Jerusalem. So in those 10 verses, is 
most likely, possibly, what's taking the four horsemen, the first four seals, are, I believe, are potentially taking place during those 10 verses in Daniel 11, 21 to 31. Because in 31, the abomination of desolation happens, the invasion of Jerusalem, and the great tribulation begins. Now, the Antichrist, my point is this, the Antichrist comes on the scene long before, not long before, three and a half years before, in a visible way, he comes on the scene in verse 21, but he invades and attacks and turns his face and reveals himself openly in verse 31. It's the same thing in Matthew 24. Joel touched on it. There's the beginning of birth pains, but guys, it's not the end yet. There'll be wars, rumors of wars. There'll be famine, earthquakes. There's gonna be pestilence. There's gonna be a lot of suffering, but it's not the end. It's not the hard labor. Not until what? Verse 15, the abomination of desolation, which also, this is a session that you'll want to go back and watch, is our teaching through the Olivet Discourse when we taught through Matthew 24, verse by verse. Jesus distinguishes the difference between the birth pangs, which is not yet the end, and the great tribulation, the hard labor. Now, you say, well, how do we know that the book of Revelation is describing the great tribulation? It says in Revelation chapter 7, these are those martyrs who come up out of the great tribulation. Anyone who dies because of these judgment events in chapter six are coming up out of the great tribulation. And the, the, the language, the Greek language in Revelation chapter seven is this, the tribulation, the great one, meaning the final, the big, the apocalyptic, the eschatological one. I wanna to touch on something real quick quick before we continue on with this, talking about the, the, the nature, the, the timing of it. Let's talk about the nature of the first four events, the first four horses. What's interesting is that these are all humans doing things to humans. So for example, we have an antichrist conquering land and people with a vision for conquering land and people. The second one is peace taken from the earth, men slay each other. It's violence and bloodshed covers the earth. The third one is financial, it's economic. It's people hoarding, keeping, taking, buying, selling, but it's people interacting with people. The fourth event is the pestilence, the sickness, the plagues, pandemics, the war, the impact of it, and the pale horse with death covering the earth and a quarter of the earth's population dying because of what men do to each other. Now, once we get to the fifth, sixth seal, and then we go through the, trum the trumpets and the bowls, everything from there on out is God doing things, not men doing things. So it's a very important point, which is why I tend to agree with Joel that the beginning, the tearing of the first seal, and specifically the first four seals, take place during the first half of the 70th week of Daniel. Because it's men doing things. But there is a moment, there is a moment where it ceases to be men doing things to one another and it's God interfering and interacting and interjecting in the created order. For example, when God turns all of the vegetation into, and burns it up, when he turns all the water into blood, when he darkens the sun and the stars and the moon, I mean, these, when he sends demonic locust plagues, when he causes hailstones, like these, this is all God. It's the, the difference between divine activity and human activity. The first four judgment events, the first, second, third, fourth seals are human initiative, human involvement, human engagement, human actions against humans or relating to humans. But after the fourth seal, everything after that, you could say the fifth seal as well, which is suffering through martyrdom. But even then, there's a divine nature to that that I believe is actually God-ordained. It's not necessarily men doing this to men, which is true of all of the events, but because God is sovereign over all of these things, but more on that later. So in light of the fact that the first four very, are, very much are like context-setting events, and I say all that to say this, these first four events set the context for the hard labor of the Great Tribulation. I don't necessarily think, however, that these are the Great Tribulation, the first four events. I believe they set the context for the Great Tribulation. Now, on the other hand, there's also good evidence to suggest 
that the first seal could actually be the abomination of desolation. It fits. By all means, it works. Meaning, he emerges and he conquers Jerusalem, and he's bent on conquering more than just Jerusalem. We read in Revelation chapter 17 and 18 that when he attacks Jerusalem, he also burns Babylon, the harlot Babylon, burns it to the ground, burns her with fire for her relationship with Jerusalem. Very interesting dynamic. He's also going to war with Egypt at that time. He's also going to war with forces from the east. He's going to war with North Africa. He's going to war with the Middle East. The Middle East is fighting itself. Peace is being taken from the earth. So it makes sense that the first seal could potentially be the abomination of desolation, which sets in motion a great world war, which sets in motion economic collapse, which sets in motion a, the death of a quarter of the earth's population, which sets in motion mass martyrdom, which sets in motion then this rolling up of the sky like a scroll and the wrath of God being revealed from heaven. This could all be compressed to, into that 42 month time frame. This is where I don't want to be dogmatic. I don't know if we can say with certainty before it happens that the first seal is taking place at the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel or in the middle. Now, if you are sure, maybe you've studied this yourself and you feel like you have an opinion, I bless you in your opinion. And that's really the, the spirit and the attitude that Joel and I want to carry in this is that you know, I've gone back and forth about this over the years. And sometimes I'm like, no, it's definitely the abomination of desolation. And other times I go, mm, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's not. There's, and there's an element here where it describes, it, it could potentially be the birth pangs that Jesus is describing. And those birth pangs are really escalating during the first half of the 70th week of Daniel. We'll find out and we'll know very clearly. And the helpful thing is, and I would say this, to, the key to interpreting and understanding the Antichrist's rise more than any other chapter in the whole Bible is Daniel 11 and 12. This is the most significant passage in the Bible that describes the rise of the Antichrist with the most amount of detail and with the most amount of New Testament dependence upon it. What do I mean by that? Meaning when Jesus taught on the Antichrist and the abomination of desolation, he quoted Daniel 11 and 12. When Paul taught on the Antichrist and the abomination of desolation, the final tribulation, he quoted Daniel 11 and 12. And in the book of Revelation as well, the descriptive uh, uh, passages in chapter 10, chapter 11, chapter 12, chapter 13, he's drawing from Daniel 11 and 12 to get, because that's what he's pulling from, because that's in his mind because he knows the Jewish scripture. Which means this, if you wanna understand the details of the rise of the Antichrist, you need to understand and you need to study Daniel. Daniel is where all this information is given in so much in a very robust, robust way. With that said, we're going to probably wrap this one to a close here. And in our next session, we're going to begin to look at the impact of the, the rider on the right horse. But I want to, in some sense, set it up by introducing it now. And then we'll go into it in detail in our next session. Look at verse 3. When he opened the second seal, okay, so the first seal is a conquering rider on a white horse, okay? A conquering rider on a white horse. And the second event that happens after that is this. We, we, I heard the second living creature say, come again, beckoning us to come. And out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that so that people should slay one another. And he was given a great sword. This is also one of the reasons why I, I lean towards, I get shifty on it, and I say maybe it is after the Great Tribulation. Because the impact of him rising is peace being taken from the earth and men butchering each other which is very much the description in Daniel chapter 11 and 12 and in Revelation chapter 12 and 13. The description of the rise of the Antichrist is very much immediate war. But having said that, Daniel 11 verses 21 through 31 also describe a series of preliminary wars before the final war to end all wars. Which means this, when we look at the new world order that's going to emerge, what do we know about it from scripture? We know this, that it's going to be in a context of perceived peace and safety. 
which is why I believe it's important that we understand that the rider on the white horse is on a white horse. He's coming in perceived peace, but that peace will be shattered violently in the middle of Daniel's 70th week. Paul said this to the Thessalonians. He said, in the last days, people are gonna come and they're gonna say, peace and safety, peace, peace, but then sudden destruction will come upon them. This is the sudden destruction. Peace, peace. Which is why I believe that the, the Antichrist, when he rises, he rises and he establishes a new world order in the Middle East. The Antichrist, when he rises, establishes a new world order in the Middle East, from the Middle East, that requires all the nations of the earth to fall in line and recognize that order, that authority structure. It's going to impact all the earth. But in the first three and a half years of the 70th week of Daniel, it's not going to be massively violent compared to what it will be when peace is taken from the earth. Now the question is this, will peace be taken from the earth before the abomination of desolation is set up or only after? We know after for sure. There is going to be the coming final eschatological world war that the nations of the earth are going to get sucked into it. Again, Daniel 11 describes the Arabian Peninsula, North Africa, the Mediterranean, parts of Europe, Asia being involved. He describes a massive, massive part of the earth being sucked into this final world war because of this emerging world order that rises in chapter 21. Now here's what we need to consider when we're looking at the landscape of events and the generation that leads to the return of the Lord and we're watching in a sober way for the rise of the final Antichrist and the rise of this final world order, what are we looking for? What we're looking for is the emergence of a world leader who comes out conquering immediately. Now this is an important point, why? And I'll end with this. There's a lot of pop cultural ideas about the Antichrist out there that he just comes as a peaceable guy and everyone falls in love with him. That's not the way the Bible describes the rise of the Antichrist. Now we know he gets violent in the middle and he wages incredible war for the final 42 months. But what's interesting from the book of Daniel is that he, when he arises at the beginning of the final week, he's not coming as a peace and love hippie right away. He's coming in violence. He's coming conquering immediately. But his conquering will establish a new world order and a kind of peace. A kind of peace. Now, any of you who've been around war, or grew up in war, you know that there is a, a peace that comes from the outcome of a war. It's not doesn't mean that there is peace, it means that there's not war. And the kind of peace that's gonna settle on the earth when the Antichrist rises, three and a half years before he invades Jerusalem, is not gonna be real peace. It's gonna be the kind of peace that comes because there's not war, because the outcome of a war. And I want you to understand this as we move forward. There will be a series of wars and rumors of wars leading up to the final war. And we need to be careful not to speculate and to get trigger happy in defining that as the final war. We're gonna see some very seismic, significant, sizable wars, a series of wars take place in the Middle East before the final war. Now these preliminary wars, like for example ISIS, ISIS reconfigured the Middle East dramatically. The Syrian civil war reconfigured the Middle East dramatically. The Arab Spring reconfigured the Middle East dramatically. And there's gonna be more wars like this. There's gonna be more groups that rise and nations that clash. There's gonna be more altercations in the Middle East, but it doesn't mean that it's the final one because these events will set the context for the rise of the rider on the white horse, who will come out immediately conquering and to conquer, which is why I think this is, is a potential nod here for the first seal being at the beginning of the final 70th week, because he comes out conquering and to conquer, meaning don't perceive that his initial conquests are necessarily his end game conquest. His end game conquest is gonna be something much more Jerusalem centric, something much more of biblical proportions, not just random regional conflicts between uh, nation states in the Middle East. It's gonna be honing on Jerusalem and it's gonna revolve around the harlot Babylon as well. 
which is a very important point that we'll get to in subsequent sessions. So in summary, we've looked at the rise of the Antichrist with the tearing of the first seal, who establishes with his rise, with his conquest, a new world order, which once we get to chapter 12 and chapter 13, we're going to see the details of this new world order and how it affects the nations of the earth in, in a very, very catastrophic, brutal, and consequential way. Now, when he rises, he sets in motion a world war, which is the second seal. And in our next session, we're going to dive into that coming world war and the impact of it on the nations of the earth. Guys, thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed this and if you want to support ministry on the ground in the Middle East, consider supporting our teams through the $5 giving mechanism. The links are below this video. Guys, thank, for, thank you for watching. And uh, Maranatha from the Golan Heights here in Northern Israel.